textiles, I think I've seen a big move towards natural fibers, and I think 2009 is supposed to be the year of the natural fiber. I don't know who dubbed that. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, it, and it's kind of interesting because I think that, to me, um, natural doesn't mean sustainable. And if people want to just take natural and say that's the right way to go, um, you know, I would, I would tend to disagree on them in a lot of cases because sustainable natural is the right way to go, but you have to be careful about if you're growing plants, how are you growing them? And then um, if you say it's renewable, are you including the inputs you're putting into the field? Are those renewable? Um, and, you know, the thing about bamboo is funny. You guys have mentioned about five times today. Everybody's like, bamboo, sustainable, bamboo. Um, you know, in, in fiber, it's a little bit different um, because you can, you can take... Bamboo for fabric. Yeah, for fabric. You can take the fiber like as a bass fiber and just process it like a hemp or linen, um, and you get a pretty boardy, stiff fabric. And, um, and it's nice. I wouldn't argue that that's not sustainable fiber, but um, there's a huge boom of bamboo on the market. And when I go into the stores and I feel it, it feels super silky smooth. And it feels like rayon, and it is rayon. It's, it's processed through a rayon process. And, um, and that process uses uh, chemicals. It's carbon disulfide as a, as a solvent. It's really gnarly. Um, you know, rayon, this is a viscose rayon. It's not, you know, an environmentally friendly fiber. And, and I, I went to a factory that makes regular rayon, and it's funny because their input was actually um, scrap. It was like the stuff that's not used for pulp and paper and wood. So it's like they have this waste product going in, this gnarly process. We're using toxic solvent. About 50% of it leaves the factory in one way or another. And then you get viscose rayon. And somebody said, well, if we put bamboo in the front end instead, now it's sustainable. And I don't think that is the right way. But I mean, people don't know that, so it's OK. And I went to Washington, DC, and, and told the FTC, too. And I don't know, maybe there'll be some change in the way it's labeled. But hopefully, we can see it labeled as bamboo rayon, and I think now I hear people talking about it more often now. It used to be I was the only one saying that. People would think I was crazy, but um, anyway, I think that's coming around. So that was just one example um, where I think people are just grabbing on to natural as sustainable, but I think um, it needs to be looked at a little more holistically. Thanks, guys. I think we're getting to the end of the program here. Uh, thank you for all of your insights. I'm going to go home and actually I'm going to remind myself to uh, qualify all my bamboo statements in the future. Um, I, do, I feel a little bit like the guy from inside the actor's studio up here, but uh, it, if everybody could give these guys a round of applause for their insights. And, and now I think we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, Molly has a mic over there. Um, hi, I just wanted to ask these guys a little bit about um, durability. I don't think anybody really touched on it tonight. Um, you hear people say stuff like, it wasn't made like it used to be. And I think it's true. I think stuff is made to break and be rebought. And it's profitable. If it breaks, you got to buy a new one soon. Uh, how are these materials that we're talking about, how are they durable? And if, because durability seems like it would be a goal for sustainability. You don't have to make as much, you don't have to buy as much, you don't have to use as much. But then is it really cutting into profits and is it making it less feasible because if it does last, then you don't have to sell as much? And, and how do you guys deal with that? Whether it be clothing or building or anything. I can speak for clothing real quick. I mean, absolutely, I think what you said is, is exactly right. Um, the most sustainable, environmentally friendly product you can make is one that lasts and you don't have to replace it. So. Um, and, and I think at one point, using a sustainable material meant that it was going to be crappy. It was going to wear out real quickly. And that's, it, it gave you know, green materials a bad rap. And that's, that's not the case. We try to approve all our materials to the same standard as we do a regular material. Because uh, I think Patagonia is known as an eco-friendly company, whatever. But they're also known as a quality company. And we don't want to trade one for one. So we want to still have the quality and also you know, reduce our footprint. I mean, for me, it hasn't really, I mean, we don't make stuff that's more sustainable and less sustainable. Um, our clients demand it to be, you know, of a certain quality. So once we've reached that quality, you know, then their clients take it. Now, we haven't really been able to take the eco-friendly product to a mass level yet. So I can't really tell if it, it hasn't been built in, certainly, to break down in a bit. But I think that um, 
people are requiring retailers and you know hospitality clients that it is a high quality product that's not going to be you know faulty in a few years so you know we try and make it as best we can every year at green build which is the largest green building trade show the vinyl industry has a booth and I, I always wonder what the guy who has to sit in that booth did wrong to have to go sit and listen you know have all the liberals <laughs> throw tomatoes at him. <laughs> but their argument is that vinyl for example in pipes is one of the longest lasting materials that uh, you can use and because it doesn't have to be replaced therefore it's sustainable or eco-friendly or green. There are people who say that PVC is not so green, but those are two sides of the argument. Um, so again, durability is a component and it has to be balanced with the other issues of, of what makes a product green. Again, like, like these guys mentioned, there's certain quality standards and durability standards in the marketplace we just have to reach. If our product falls apart, well, we're gonna have a pretty short shelf life as a company. If that PVC pipe, um, falls apart before the building does, then that's a problem. But if the At PVC, least, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think it, it needs to be durable enough for its application, you know, like, of course. Um, because what about, you know, 10,000 years later, the PVC pipe's still there. It's super durable, you know, right. all right, good job. That's, that's a problem now, it's too durable. Uh, it needs to be like engineered for the application, I think is the right yeah. amount. No, that would be a good reality point. show yeah. to watch that booth. <laughs> <laughs> okay questions for you. Uh, first one, in the 70s we went through a similar type of cycle uh, where being green and doing everything organic was very big. What's different about this time? And the second one is there are a lot of products out there that are so-called organic, but they come from countries that are involved in human rights abuses, apartheid, other things. How do you separate that from the actual greenness? Because I have a problem with buying something if it's human rights abuses too. I mean, if I can begin that. Um, like back to the durability, the same thing as my clients demand that it's, you know, um, human rights, everything is safe, and that, you know, and we have to provide them with the right documents and everything. So I think it's the, the responsibility of the clients that we're working with that sort of cover that part. And then I, I can't remember what your second question, first question was. Oh, I think that. Well, actually, you know, I, was, I wasn't born back then. <laughs> <laughs> I was say, actually, I'd like to hear from you what you think is different because uh, I was four. <laughs> uh, is the government behind it this time? Um, are there, there, do they have money for it more this time? And do you feel the market is making real demands for quality, for durability, for fabulousness that weren't there then? I think the answer to that question is, you know, I can sit down at the breakfast table now with my grandfather and have a conversation about Korean, and he gets excited about it because he's into energy independence. And I'm, I'm excited about it because of uh, reducing CO2 and the opportunity to be part of a big growth industry. So I think it's interesting. You have people at different sides of the political spectrum or value spectrum, frankly, and talking about the same thing and wanting the same thing. So I think this time it's, it's there's lots of different um, forces all kind of pushing in the same direction. and. That gives me confidence. I mean, I would have said energy prices a year ago, but that's, you know, obviously changed. And um, you know, now we have to have the political will to see it see it through. Um, I, I don't know if I can answer your first question either about the time thing, but um, I'm hoping that what started in the '70s, it, we're building on it now, and and you know, it might go up and down, but I'm hoping that in the long term we're getting better and. Yeah, if you travel around the world, you can see there's definitely better models than I think some people are ahead of us, and hopefully that's that's where we're going to be. But um, I was thinking about the other question you said about organic and how that interplays with social aspects. And a lot of times, if there's a standard for organic or, or whatever kind of standard for um, environmental uh, practices, it generally doesn't include any kind of social aspect um, because it's difficult to include both of those together. They're, they're both really complex, um, you know, systems. So 